You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. When we walk out the door in the morning, we have to make a personal commitment to safety. Your life and perhaps your partner's life may depend on how focused you are. How am I going to park my vehicle? What am I going to look for before I walk up to the resident? What if you walk in and, and, and a fender comes in behind you? What we try to do with safety training is put the odds in our favor. Try to expect the unexpected with every contact. There's always going to be something that's not on paper. You just forget that even in your office, you could have an incident. Luck may or may not be there for you one day, but it's not a strategy. Be determined that whatever it is that you have to do, you're going to go home. Get your mind right. Plan to go home. It's real. Safety Series, Offenders and Defendants with Mental Disorders. Hi everyone, welcome to the Federal Judicial Center's Safety Series, where today we're going to talk about safety and offenders and defendants with mental health disorders. I'm Mark Maggio and I'll be moderating the broadcast today. To discuss this topic, we've got three panelists with us today. Uh, we have Rich Feldman, who's a senior U.S. probation officer, retired from the District of Maryland. Rich recently retired in December of 2004 and we kind of nudged him out of retirement to come down for the broadcast, so we appreciate that. We have Matt Faubert. Matt is a USPO from uh, Sacramento, the Eastern District of California. And we have Miggy Baerga. Miggy is the Mental Health Administrator with the Office of Probation and Pretrial Services at the AO. We've got two scenarios we're going to show you today. Scenarios that, as we've done in the past, are based on actual incidents taken from the uh, hazardous incident reports from probation and pretrial services. Peppered between these two scenarios, we're also going to include an interview with another retired probation officer, Terry Childers. Our producer, Robin Rowland, sat down with Terry a couple of months ago to talk with him about safety and, and mental health issues. And I'll tell you more about that interview a little later on in the program. Okay, that's what I've got for uh, kicking things off, so why don't we start our program. Let's look at our first scenario. We call this one Changes. Let's roll the tape and watch. Yeah. Jay Warren is here now. All right. Tell him I'll be right out to get him. Oh. Wait a minute, does he seem disturbed or upset at all? Okay. I'll come out, but would you please call Sarah and also let her know that he's here? Thanks, Rosemary. I had last seen Jay Warren three weeks ago. I had had him transported to the emergency room when he confided during a routine office contact that he planned to cut his wrists. At the hospital, the nature of his threats changed from suicide to homicide. He was committed to the mental wing with a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia, but he was back out in a week. I had been unable to locate him since his release. My request for a hearing to impose mental health conditions was pending. Have a seat, Mr. Warren. I don't think I can. How are you doing? Not good, Miss Perry. Not good at all. I need you to put me in jail. Why do you say that? A lot of reasons. Maybe I can sit down now. I need to relax. You said before that I should put you into jail. Is that because of anything you did? I'm not going to tell you anything. How do I even know you're trustworthy? You're the question lady. You were at my job before, asking questions. I was just trying to get in touch with you. Well, I don't work there anymore. Hey, where's that guy? That guy? Are you talking about Officer Blanco? He's the one you talked to before you were sentenced. Yeah, Blanco. He is trustworthy, unless he's changed. You want me to call him? Don't worry, he's still the same. Hi, Alex. So you got your phone line fixed. Hmm. 
No, I don't think so. Not yet, anyway. Jay Warren is in my office right now. He's telling me he's been having some problems. Yeah, well, he's asked if you could join us because he knows you're trustworthy. Okay. Good. He'll be right here. Hey, Mr. Warren, how you doing? Bad, very bad. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Mr. Warren was just going to tell us why he thinks we should put him in jail. The floors there are really cool. They have the coolest floors. They're green. And if I could just lay down on that floor, it might relax me. How about at the hospital? Could you relax there at all? No, no, and no! That was a bad scene, terrible. I told them and told them and told them, no drugs. And they tied me up, stuck needles in me, and got me addicted. Now I'm out on the street. I, I'm coming down from this stuff, and I don't even know what it is. What's it like coming down? I'm having fits is what it's like. I, I, I freak out. I punch things. I crash into walls. Look at that. How did that happen? I attacked a building. I never know when I'm going to go off. I could be any time. They turned me into a fucking time bomb. Can you tell me more about what happens when you go off? Maybe you'll find out for yourself. I'm ready to kill you right now. I could just go off, and that's that. Not a good idea, Mr. Warren. Miss Perry is trying to get you some help here. You do want to stop going off, right? I'm having body changes happening to me right now. <laughs> At least three. You can't help me. It's too late. Mr. Warren, we can help you. We can get you into treatment so you can relax and stop going off. But to do that, we're going to have to change the conditions of your supervision a little bit. I'm going to ask you if you would be willing to sign a paper letting us change your conditions so that we can get you some help. I don't think so. I don't need your help. But we're concerned. We're afraid you're going to hurt yourself or somebody else, and we know you don't want to do that, so... Do you feel my hands around your throat yet? No? You know something? I don't either. You may be in luck, my friend. I don't think I'm going to hurt you. And I can't hurt myself. Nobody can now. So? Everything is copacetic. Goodbye. All right, now we're going to give you some time to discuss the scenario at your site. And when you come back, we'll uh, engage the panel and see what they have to say.
Okay, welcome back. Let me start the panel discussion. Rich, I'm going to throw the first question to you. Um, from the defendant, Warren, what, what behavioral clues uh, did he display that you think should have alerted the officer that he was in a mental health crisis, and how do you think the officer handled the situation early on? Well, she had some, the first clues obviously she had was that she knew that he had been committed uh, against his will to a hospital because of suicidal and homicidal ideations. So she knew that going in. Uh, but when she saw him in the office, uh, it seems clear to me that his hygiene was poor, he hadn't shaved, his clothes were disheveled. Um, then when she brought him down to the, uh, to the office, he indicated quite readily that he was agitated. He couldn't sit down. He couldn't relax. Uh, that was a clue that something was still going on, I think. I think she handled it real well. First of all, when she was walking down the hallway, she was expressed concern, uh, kind of a nurturing attitude. She wasn't uh, antagonistic towards him or even appearing frightened. And when he came to the office and he could not sit down, she stood up with him. She mirrored, mirrored his reactions, which I think uh, would help him with some level of comfort. And also, I think as a safety factor, was a good move on her part. Standing uh, when he stands, sitting when he sits, that type of thing. Ex yeah. Exactly. I think it was clear to her at that point that, uh, that something was still going on despite the fact he'd been released from the hospital. Let me ask you about the, just real quick standing and sitting uh, issue because every once in a while it raises its head during safety discussions. And I know officers, some officers said you know, they will sit regardless because they just feel like it, it helps put uh, the defender or offender at ease. Um, in this situation, dealing with a mental health offender, given the behavior we saw, mm -hmm. uh, you're n I'm not hearing from you that you think, you know, uh, doing what she did would have exacerbated it. It was a good move on her part from a safety point, but also mm -hmm. didn't create any undue anxiety in him, apparently. I, I don't think so. I, first of all, I think, uh, I think the offender was clearly engaged in his own uh, presentation and what he was thinking, what he was doing. Yeah. I'm not sure he was paying much attention to her reactions, uh, at least in the scenario. In addition, uh, if someone's standing up and walking around, I don't think you really want to sit down and be at, uh, at a disadvantage because his behavior at that point was clearly unpredictable. So I think she made a good move. Okay. Maggie, let me jump to you on this, uh, kind of tying into what Rich was just talking about uh, with some of the behaviors the defendant uh, displayed clearly in, in some sort of stage of mental health crisis. Comment on the officer, given what she knew about this guy going in, given the homicidal, suicidal situation. Um, meeting up with him one-on-one -on -one in her office? Well, given the little data that we have in, in this scenario, um, I think the officer could have um, used an alternative option in terms of meeting the... I would have met this offender at a, um, in an interview office where I had an escape route. She didn't have this. I mean, if you notice in the scenario, her desk was facing the wall and the offender had the escape, escape route. Yeah, the minute you know. he sat down, she went around, sat down. He's got kind of a, a, a way to block that escape route. Right. Down. She, you know, uh, the other thing I would have done a little differently was I, I would not have met with him so quickly. I would have went out there, acknowledged that he was there, not put this responsibility on the clerk, but go out there and say, hey, um, you know, I'm um, working on something else. Can you please wait, give me a couple of minutes? And then I would have went back and tried to contact the hospital and get some information as to what his mental health status was when he left that hospital. Did he leave, um, uh, you know, was he discharged or did he leave against medical advice? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, just so, to get an idea, what am I dealing with now? Or if I couldn't get information from the hospital because that's not always possible, um, I would have at minimum tried to reach the family, somebody to see, hey, what kind of frame of mind this guy's in. I would have tried to do that. Okay, when you bring him back one-on-one -on -one in the interview room, you're going to alert officers or supervisors that you're meeting with him there? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's another thing that I, I probably would have done um, Would you bring one of them into the room with you, or would you just hold off and do the one-on-one, -on -one but in a different location? You know, um, not initially. I think that it, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do that for a couple of reasons. One, um, this tag team mm -hmm. in, in initial mm -hmm. meeting, I, I think it, it exacerbates things. I mean... With someone like this who has a, a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia, I think that would exacerbate his parano paranoia, you know what I mean? So I, I would not have done that. But I would certainly, um, before I met with him, alerted supervisors and, and colleagues, hey, be my eyes and ears, watch out, you know, just in case things get out of hand, call the police or call the marshals, have some kind of a plan before I met with him. Okay, good enough. Matt, let me go to you. Do we have, uh, in your opinion, did this contact come a time where 
this became a crisis situation for the officer. We know the offender was pretty much in a cri mental health crisis, but how about a, being becoming a crisis situation for the officer? Well, with his with the offender's escalating behavior, it's it's becoming a crisis. It becomes a crisis when the offender threatens to assault her, threatens to put his uh, hands around her neck, uh, is threatening to, to hurt other people. At that, at that point, it does become a crisis. Now, in, in the scenario, you'll see that she's moving things off of her desk, which tells me that she is uh, cognizant of the fact that it's becoming a crisis situation for her as well as for the offender. Um, so in that, in that respect, it's good that she is increasing her level of awareness to meet the, uh, the crisis situation that's occurring with the offender. When she called the second officer in, do you think that helped diffuse somewhat or kept it the same? How do you think that, that, that worked out? Uh, I think it was to her benefit to have him in there. Um, I don't know that it, it uh, diffused the offender's uh, escalation. Um, but it, it was certainly a good move on her part to have him in here just for her own safety, uh, especially since her, her um, escape route was blocked. Let me stay with you on this for a minute. Is third party risk? There's definitely a third party risk. Um, he leaves a building. Uh, if you're in a building that has marshal service, you need to notify the marshals. You also need to notify local law enforcement to do a uh, welfare check on him, just uh, determining whether or not he is currently suicidal, homicidal, gravely disabled. Um, and in California, local law enforcement can write involuntary holds on offenders. Uh, so it, you would have to check with your state to okay. see if, if that's uh, applicable. Good suggestion. Mickey, you want to say something? Yeah, else? I just wanted to add that um, in order for officers to effectively deal with a crisis like that, those of you who know me personally or have worked with me or have trained you, I'm very proactive and, and I tr truly believe that if you have a prearranged crisis intervention plan in place where you have emergency contact numbers, law, you know, names of law, local law enforcement officers or at least their numbers, um, definitely uh, the names and numbers of a treatment provider and family members, you can deal with these situations a little bit s more smoothly, I think, when they, when they arise. Always have a plan in place. Okay. I just want to encourage if I can that it's a, I think it's a, <clears throat> our obligation as federal probation officers to, uh, to follow up on this case. And, I mean, uh, you know, more often than not, these kinds of cases will show up at 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, and you've got things going, or uh, mm -hmm. I, I really think this is not the kind of individual that if, if, he's, if he's able to leave the office, if he has to leave the office, that you're going to have to drop, that you drop it, that you, you sh should follow up with the family, you should try to sit, uh, get services in place for him, or uh, do something so that it doesn't continue on to the next day, because clearly he has issues, and if he was suicidal or homicidal before, he, even though he was in the hospital, uh, he could be again, and that's not something a probation officer should, should drop. Okay. And Mark, I, yeah. I would like to add one last thing. Uh, in our office, at least, we have panic alarms. And if you're, if you're an officer and you feel like you're in a crisis situation, then you can hit that panic alarm and get some help up there. So you shouldn't have to necessarily uh, wait until the offender actually threatens to kill you or oh, threatens yeah. to kill other people. If you feel like it's escalated to a, a crisis situation, then you should hit that panic alarm and get some help up there. Great point. One of the other things we touched on, and I'll, I want to move on to the next question, Rich, and throw it to you, but um, we talked uh, briefly uh, as we were preparing for, the, for today's program about letting the guy just walk out of the office at that particular point. And, Miggy, I think you brought up uh, a discussion you had had, if I'm not mistaken, with, with David Adair about the ability to physically restrain. Right. Um, all for th because of our limited statutory authority, um, we are not uh, authorized to physically restrain someone. Of course, uh, David Adair suggested that we contact the, the marshals or the police. I mean, make somebody aware of what's going on after they leave, if they leave without your control, but don't try to hold them back. Okay. Rich, let me go with you with the last question for this scenario. Um, you noticed as the, as the, def the offender went through his... Uh, body changes right. and during that time or shortly after that the officer comes back and tries to get him to sign that change of supervision conditions comment on sort of the task oriented approach there uh, first l let me say as a probation officer for so many years I understand uh, her concerns I, I think she had a uh, pending hearing going on and she wanted this uh, sign it would have made the hearing perhaps easier or uh, uh, go more smoothly but it seems clear to me that the offender was, uh, his head was not in that place, as they say. Uh, he was having d difficulty with his thinking processes. I don't think, 
I'm not even sure he would be considered competent later on, looking back, to have signed a document like that. I also think asking him to perform a task like that may have been construed by him, in a par if he in fact was paranoid, mm -hmm. as being confrontative or antagonistic. Uh, I think there were other issues going on, her safety being number one, number two, determining what was going on with him, uh, and maybe even referring him out for services. I think signing the document may have been the fourth or fifth thing to do at that time. To bottom line, oh, all, no. all, all things considered, we could have let that, in your opinion, could have let That's that That's a short answer, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, good point. Okay, um, that's the last word for this scenario, and what we're going to do now is go to our interview. Uh, as I said, our producer, Robin Rowland, sat down with Terry Childers uh, to talk about this topic of safety and mental health offender population. Uh, I believe I mentioned Terry w is a retired probation officer, was in Illinois Northern in the Chicago office, and Terry had, uh, had spent uh, time as a mental health specialist, as well as when he retired, he was a SUSPO. At the time of the interview that we conducted with Terry, he was the executive director of the Sex Offender Conditional Release Program with Liberty Healthcare. So let's uh, take some time, watch the interview, and we'll come back and talk a little bit about it. Terry, welcome. Thank you. Let's get right into the subject of this broadcast, which is officer safety and mental health disorders. Do offenders and defendants with mental health disorders pose a greater safety risk to officers than other offenders and defendants? I think that depends, and I think what's important is not necessarily that they have a mental health disorder, but if they are symptomatic. The person can have diabetes, and if the person has taken insulin, the person's going to be fine. A person may have schizophrenia, and if he's on the medication, he might also be fine, but if he's not taking the medication and becomes symptomatic, then that raises all sorts of issues for the officer, including a safety issue. For instance, a person who has bipolar disorder, uh, who might stop taking medication, might experience what we call a manic episode. And during a manic episode, um, people with bipolar disorder usually do things that they would usually not do under other circumstances. And violence could be one of those things. Uh, another thing you'd always want to be concerned about with many, any mental health disorder, and it's no different from any other offender, is uh, drugs and alcohol. A mentally ill person who uh, stops taking his psychotropic medication might begin to self-medicate by taking illicit drugs or alcohol, and that's always pretty bad news relative to safety risks. If you were supervising an officer who was about to take on a mental health caseload, for the first time, what advice would you give? Well, certainly I think the first meeting uh, that any officer has with a mentally ill offender should not be in the offender's home. I think it's much uh, more safe for that meeting to be in the office itself. Another thing that I would, that I cannot suggest strongly enough and we can easily overlook it, is reading the file. Before you see the, the offender, please read the file. Um, I had one case in particular that it was a, uh, a person who had schizophrenia and was a presidential threat. He had sent a hand grenade to the White House when President Clinton was still there. Mm. And he was a very, very small man. He had a master's degree from Purdue University in electronic engineering or something and, and just appeared to be the most non-threatening person that one would ever seen. But, uh, before I met him for the first time, I read his entire case file, and, and in there were included assaults on police officers with knives. Wow. And uh, the only way I knew that was because I read that file. Are there particular qualities that you would look for in an officer you think would be suitable to take on a mental health caseload, or conversely, particular qualities that you think you would want to avoid in somebody who is going to have that, that job? I think I, I would want to look for a person who has a certain amount of comfort with ambiguity. So in other words, I certainly wouldn't choose a person to supervise mentally ill people uh, as I would choose a person to supervise financial crimes offenders. Flexibility is an absolute necessity, and being able to adapt to situations, being able to hear everything the offender is saying through its entirety 
and just not stopping to hear it because there's one thing that's said that sounds absolutely bizarre. Any particular advice on collaborating with mental health professionals? Probation officers and therapists have one thing in common, and when they refer to a case, they use the pronoun my. It's my case. Uh, let me tell you what my case did the other day. Or I had this case yesterday and blah, blah, blah. When we begin to deal with mentally ill offenders, we have to work collaboratively and we have to work very closely with the treatment provider. And my case becomes our case. Mm. And that does require a shift, uh, not only from the probation officer, but from the treatment provider as well. But the onus is on the probation officer to educate the treatment provider as to why that is so important. And how do you do that? I, I would do it by uh, sitting down and talking to the treatment provider. Um, hopefully before the offender meets the provider for the first time, explaining that confidentiality is, is very different in this case as it is in any private cases that the therapist might have. And focusing on that, what I'm really interested in is seeing that the offender maintain compliance with the conditions of supervision and be well, be mentally well. Seeing that you two are comfortable with each other probably is yes. helpful to the offender it as well. It is very helpful mm -hmm. uh, because very frequently uh, different types of offenders will work very, very hard at splitting the probation officer and the therapist. That's a very common occurrence. That's interesting. And it's a form of manipulation. What about partnering uh, when you're dealing with a, a mentally ill offender or defendant, what, are, what would be, it sounds like you might get into similar issues if you were sharing your caseload with a partner as to what you would have with the mental health professional. I, I think the optimal way is to have one officer responsible for the one case. Um, I think partnering can be very good, however, if if you're looking for another probation officer to be some sort of a witness to hear what the offender might be saying to you because he might deny he said those things later. But I don't know if that's any different with a mental health case than any other case. We often think that there's a safety benefit to having two officers there if somebody is volatile or, or a safety risk. I realize there's a lot of debate about the safety in numbers, and I've, I've probably never settled down on either, on either side of the argument. But I think if you're, if you're about to make a home visit and the person is clearly volatile and making threats and all these other things, then I would just say, don't go. If it's more of a situation that you want to bring a partner with you just because you want to get a feel for what's happening here or you want another eyes and ears for you. You know, what do you think? He's saying these things. What do you think about that? I want another opinion. I think that's fine. I would think that establishing rapport and trust with an offender with a mental disorder might be particularly challenging. It's, once again, it's true depending upon the type of person you're dealing with. Um, but so frequently, um, the level of trust needs to be established, I think, for really effective supervision, and it can be. I think something that I was always struck by in all my years in probation, uh, and I think there's a pathos to this that I never got over, is for many, many of the mentally ill offenders that I supervised, I became the most important person in their lives for their emotional support. Mm. I don't think that's a good thing. It's a lot of responsibility. It's a lot of responsibility, you. and I don't think it's a good thing, and I think it's a reflection on, on how we treat mentally ill people in our society. Ironically, I think sometimes, and I hate to use a psychoanalytic term for this, but you become a parent to them. Uh, you're, you might be the first person in their lives who are telling them no. You might be the pers person in their lives who are giving them some sort of very concrete direction. And they might resist that initially, but if they do come around to it, you become a very critical person in their lives. And does that make you 
safer or less safe or neither? Or I'm just thinking of the sort of balancing being this trust figure, parent figure, whatever, for the offender versus being right. constantly mindful well, the, of your I, safety. When I say the apparent, the parent figure, I'm talking about their perception. Um, my safety glass never comes down. It's, it's always there. I'm not saying that there should be what they call it, a counter-transference, and you feel toward him as a parent would for a child. I don't think that should happen. It never happened with me. I think if you did let that happen, and, and it somehow crosses the line and becomes a much more familial relationship than a professional one, then that, I do believe that compromises your safety then. Because you no longer are the professional. It's no longer a helping relationship. And that, that can be very unhealthy for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. Safety is just one of them. Suppose an officer is supervising a defendant or offender who doesn't have a diagnosed mental condition but the officer is concerned that something is going on here, that the person may actually mm -hmm. be suffering from a disorder. What are some of the common behavioral signs that the officer might look for? Well, I think what he could look for are changes in, in behavior, as you said, attitude and appearance. Uh, be behaviors uh, might include uh, any, any changes in his life, changes in, in sleep patterns, changes actually in speech patterns. A person who's in a manic phase of a bipolar disorder will begin to speak very rapidly like this and have all sorts of thoughts going on all at mm -hmm. the same time. And if that's not how he usually speaks, that can be somewhat of a clue to you. Uh, attitudinal things. A person who's usually very expressive with you uh, might suddenly uh, not be expressive at all, might appear to be very reticent to provide you with any information, might not let you in for a home visit when mm -hmm. historically he always has. And as for appearance, um, any changes in personal grooming, significant changes that he hasn't washed his hair, brushed his teeth, or changed his clothes. So it's easier to determine with an offender or defendant that you've been working with for a while, so you, you know what a significant change is. Yes, exactly. You have to have a baseline of some kind. Mm -hmm. Looking back, Terry, over the career that you have had dealing with federal offenders with mental disorders, any last thoughts, uh, recommendations that you'd like to leave us with? You know, what, what always gave me the most gratification working with the mentally ill is that you can truly make a difference in a person's life. And I, I, I love that job. You can do that with both your, your clinical intervention and, frankly, with the authority of your office. Uh, a therapist can't make a person go to treatment, ironically. Sometimes a probation officer, by virtue of the court order, can do exactly that. In all my years in probation, I love being a mental health specialist more than anything else. Terry, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Terry gave us a lot of information, a lot of things to think about. There are two uh, items that he mentioned that sort of got the, uh, the panel involved a little bit while we were watching the interview, and I want to uh, put one of the questions and, and comments that uh, Rich made. Talking about what Terry said going on, being the most important person in the defendant's life, he kind of, well, he didn't kind of, he actually said he doesn't really view that as a good thing. And you were kind of disagreeing with that. So we you comment a little bit on I, that, Rich? Okay, uh, I think, uh, I don't think it's necessarily a good thing if the, defend, if the offender is dependent on you or if uh, he sees you as a father figure because I mean, we have an authoritarian role, uh, even a clinical role sometimes. So that's not really that good. But I do think there's a different take on it, which is many times the offenders we've been working with have gone through the mental health system and the criminal justice system and never really gotten continuity of care or maybe no one person's had a whole picture of what they've been through. And generally when our, with our, within our system, which I think is a great thing, we have the pre-sentence investigation which hopefully will contain a lot of information about where they've been through the mental health system uh, or professionals in criminal justice. 
we ha will have a lot of information about them, and I think that's comforting to the offender. It's also comforting to give it to the treatment specialist, that, to um, give them the information, the whole picture of the offender. I think if the offender knows that, that's a good thing, and that's very important in their lives. So operating really from the, the offender's mindset mm -hmm. in terms of uh, they view you as the most important person is kind of something you, I mean, it's, 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 it's a, a relationship you can make work to the betterment of, of, of the, the treatment for the, for the offender is what I'm hearing you say this time. Uh, most definitely, and I think, yeah. I think it's a, a role that we sometimes underappreciate, that we have that information, that we can actually help them, and they see that often. Uh, we do want to take control of the situation, though, so that it doesn't get out of hand, um, so they don't see us as a, uh, so they don't see us as having a special relationship, so to speak. Appreciate the perspective. Yeah. And Miggy, you had mentioned you wanted to comment when, when Terry mentioned the importance of reading the file, and you had some things you wanted to say on that, that I, point. I just don't want, uh, I, I can't overemphasize what Terry said about reading that case file. Um, as a former mental health treatment specialist, I used to go out to the field with officers um, who were line officers but um, did not carry a mental health caseload, but had mental health cases. And I can't tell you how many times I went out and would ask them, you know, certain questions as we're driving there, you know, what about this, what about that? And, and, and they wouldn't know the answer. So, and I basically would say, well, did you read the file? Oh, well, I, I didn't have time. And what I would say to you out there in the field, make time to read that file because that's your life and, and the life of, of the partners that are going out with you. So don't take it lightly. Um, but those of you who do not have a mental health background or may not have a mental health treatment specialist to go out with you in the field in, in cases like this, um, don't worry because OPPS has identified resources for you that could help you in getting just a general idea of, of general mental health disorders and treatment and medications and the like. Um, you can find our website on the OPPS webpage. To access that, you go to the JNET. Um, click on especially for and go to probation and pretrial services. From there, you click, um, go to working with defendants and offenders and click on mental health treatment. There you'll, you'll not only find links um, related to mental health, but you'll, you'll find legal opinions, um, frequently asked questions, and better practices to consider. Okay. Thanks a lot, Maggie. Appreciate that. Thank you. All right, let's move on now. We're going to look at our next scenario. Uh, the title for this one is called The 357. And once you watch it, I think you'll understand why. Let's roll the tape. Lau Worley's life is severely affected by post-traumatic stress disorder. He is now on federal probation for false statements in acquisition of a firearm. He was convicted of second-degree murder 20 years ago. He's in a methadone maintenance program and is also on Valium and Prozac. At the time of this routine home contact, Mr. Worley had just undergone a psychiatric evaluation. I hadn't seen the report yet, but the evaluator told me it had revealed a number of pathologies. What about the home detention thing? Have you heard from the judge yet about that? Yes, I did get the memo back from the judge. I have it right here. Ooh. Well, maybe I, I don't have it. You know what? I, I think I left it in my briefcase in the car. I'll just run and get it. Okay, I have it right here. Just take a look at... Get the 357, honey. He doesn't have a gun. Go on, I'll hold him here. Go on, Wanda, get the gun so I can shoot him! <laughs> I wish you could see the look on your face. <laughs> you can come down off the ceiling. I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is not funny. 
Jeez, can't you take a joke? Hey, what does the memo say? Step away from the door, please. Hey, I'm not going to hurt you. Haven't you ever heard a joke before? I want you to report to my office at 8 a.m. in the morning. We'll talk then. All right, now it's time for you again to discuss the scenario at your site. We'll give you a few minutes to do so, and again, we'll come back afterwards and join the panel. Okay, welcome back. First question, Rich, to you on this incident. What do you think the probation officer, Officer Sorrell, could have done differently, if anything, in your opinion, um, while he interacted with Worley, given Worley's mental, mental health case history? It would have been helpful if he had read the psychological report 
to know what pathologies were evident before he made the home visit. But he, he knew that he had a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, also known as PTSD. Mm -hmm. Given that, he could have expected the offender to have a high uh, elevated startle response, perhaps have some kind of sleep disturbance, uh, uh, perhaps some volatile mood swings, and certainly uh, some irritability, which I found in cases that have had this diagnosis. Given that, uh, he, he, would want of them, he would want to have been uh, flexible in, the, in a home business situation. I think he, I think he was. I think he um, understood the kind of person he was dealing with. I'm not sure that I would have gone into the kitchen in that situation mm -hmm. and uh, had, my, had the doorway blocked, but I think he handled it the best way possible. You bring up a good point when you talk about just some of the, some of the characteristics of PTSD. Uh, I imagine, you know, it certainly would be important, again, for officers, uh, particularly those you, you alluded to earlier, Miggy, who are not mental health specialists, maybe not necessarily familiar with the certain diagnosis and behaviors and characteristics associated with this, to become familiar. Yes, if you have an offender that has a diagnosis, I think you should uh, do some research on it. Um, in fact, looking at this offender, he may, it looks like he may even have had a serious personality disorder, engaging in that kind of joke, as he mm -hmm. called it. Uh, and I think maybe the report would have indicated that and the officer could have looked that up, could have researched that. Okay. Matt, let me go to you. Um, talking from more of a, a real safety perspective, what were Sorrell's options and what were the officer's options once his escape route was blocked? I agree with Rich in that I, th I think that the officer acted appropriately. He uh, followed the ladder of force uh, in that his next option was to tell the offender to move away from the door, which is where his exit was. Um, the offender complied, uh, although he got some help from his wife. Um, I don't know if he was carrying uh, OC spray or not, but that would have been his next option. Uh, had the offender not moved away from the door, he could have uh, deployed the OC. Um, but besides that, he, he acted appropriately. He followed the escalation of force. Um, and fortunately, the, the offender moved. The wife helped him, but suppose she had been more compliant with his directive, whether or not we don't know there, if there was actually a gun present. But you know, how do you sort of control her in addition to watching the, the defendant or offender's behavior? Well, I think at that point, your, your main thing is getting out of the house. So, uh, unfortunately, he doesn't have a partner with him. Uh, he's going to have to try to keep his eyes on both of them at the same time. Um, but his main focus at that point is getting out of the house. If she makes a move for a weapon and he doesn't have his, his weapon with him or he doesn't have OC or a baton, his main thing is getting out of the house. And a greater concern because he's in the kitchen, which we all know probably uh, the, the room in the house that has the most weapons available. Right. Potentially now, so. If he has a cell phone, you know, he could also uh, employ that. He could, he could call law enforcement and um, let them know that right. he, he's in a situation. Okay. Miggy, Matt alluded to the issue of the partner. You think having a partner in this would have made a difference? Absolutely. I think um, had there been a partner, I don't think he would have joked like that. I mean, I don't think he would have um, taken the risk to do that. I'm a big, a huge proponent of um, partnering with someone because basically it avoids situations like this possibly um, and secondly your partner brings an extra pair of eyes and ears you know that that you wouldn't have if you if you're alone I think um, but dealing with mental health case cases um, again understanding that a lot of situations could have an element of unpredictability oh, absolutely. depending on who these individuals are and whether they're on medications or not um, maybe that issue of unpredictability can become even, you know, more pronounced. Do you just, do you grab a partner at this point, or do you want to go to this situation with someone you've worked with in the past? Oh, yes, I'm glad you're bringing up that point. Um, you want somebody that's not going to be a liability for you out in the field or, or, or raise, you know, create problems for you. There are certain people that I just would not go out in the field with just because of their personality style or, you know, they were too law enforcement oriented and, the, and they would exacerbate the situation if, if, we, if a crisis did arise. So yes, you have to be careful who you partner up with. And of course, if you're going out with a partner, I'm assuming you all would agree, if he or she is not, uh, say, a mental health specialist or up on certain diagnosis and, and you know you've got this uh, particular case with this particular diagnosis, you're going to educate them up front or tell oh, them, absolutely. as you said, Rich, to read absolutely. about it. Here's what we can expect. Here's what to look I would, for. I would like to add, though, that uh, uh, 
even if you were, especially in mental health cases, I think, if you have someone that's on medication but had a violent past, but because they're on medication, they're doing well, and you feel you don't need to take a partner that day, I'm not sure that's a, a good guess. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a client, you're a, you're a offender, could be on medication and still decompensate and still have symptoms. Oh, awesome. There could be a stressor that happened the night before that you're not aware of. Yeah. Or the doctor, in many of my cases, doctors have lower dosages that I haven't even been aware of, and doctors usually do that, in fact. They want to get the, the lowest poss uh, possible dose. Yeah. Uh, so it is unpredictable, and uh, it's just hard to predict what you're going to find out when you make a field visit. And your point about just because they're on meds doesn't mean they're going to be asymptomatic. Absolutely. I think it is a good one for folks to remember. Matt, let me come back uh, to you again. What does that conversation sound like the morning after when he's, he's ordered this guy to come back and meet with him at 8 a.m.? What does that conversation sound like? How, how, what's going to happen there? Uh, I think uh, although we do wear a counseling hat, so to speak, I think it's more punitive than anything else. Um, I, I think that we have cause to notify the, the judge of his behavior, although we may not uh, want to take formal action. We need to notify our, our, our suspo. We may even want to have our suspo in there with us uh, during this meeting. Um, I, I would want to get this guy into some counseling uh, because that's what we have vendors for, um, and they can determine what was going on with him. I don't think it's a time uh, or the place to, to start getting into a counseling session with him. I think you need to let him know that that was inappropriate, that it wasn't funny, that you're taking this very seriously and, and handle it from there. But uh, counseling uh, outpatient basis is definitely warranted. Uh, okay. I'd like to add also that, uh, especially this is a new case, it's also an opportunity when they come in the office, before we become punitive, before we lay down the law, is to try to get his information, as much information from him as to why he engaged in that kind of uh, episode. What was his attitude? Was there some kind of stressor going on? Uh, because once, I think once we become more directive, you, that kind of information is going to shut down. And if you're going to have a case for one to three years on supervised release especially, you're going to be back and forth to this guy's home. And you want to find out what, you know, what caused this to happen. Um, so you're going to take kind of a dual approach, uh, kind of tying in what Matt says, but also right. you're going to, it sounds like, if I dare use the word, a little more clinical approach. Well, I don't, I don't it, it, it's interesting you say, I don't see it as a clinical approach. I see more as an intelligence, you know, an okay. intel kind of thing. But, but if, you, if you are a clinician, I do think you have a heads up to get into his head, so to speak, to find out what's motivating this guy. Are we bringing yeah. the wife in the next morning, by the way? Is she coming in with him? Or are we going to talk to her? At what, if we are, what point? Well, I would ask him to bring his wife in okay. uh, and, and talk to her at some point. Good. I just want to respond to um, your clinical approach. Um, our officers are not high. Well, even though some of us have a background in mental health, our role is not as, as mental health providers. And that's why we have contracted treatment providers. That's their role to do. And I think that that's something that we should keep in mind. I agree with you. I would want to do that uh, maybe later on and, you know, uh, as I get to know this case, but. Yeah. Well, I'll be fair to Rich. Clinical was my term. He, he used intelligence, so we'll, we'll keep that balance there. Um, so we're going to bring the wife in, talk with her one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we're going back to do a search. We, we've got an issue of, of the possibility of a gun there. Are we going to talk about coming back to a search, Matt? I, I think search is, is definitely appropriate in this case if, you're, if your district has a search policy in place. Um, but definitely a, a search is warranted. And Miggy, we're going to report this as a hazardous incident. I'll give uh, you the last word. Absolutely. This is, this is, he made a threat to kill the officer. It should be reported immediately to the chief probation, office, probation officer or the pretrial services um, chief in writing and fax to the office of probation and pretrial services. Okay. Definitely. On that note, I want to thank my panel uh, for joining us, Rich Feldman, Matt Fobert, and Miggy Bayerga. I always want to thank as well our participants, those of you out on the sites who took time out of your valuable uh, days to watch, uh, sit and watch. We hope you got some benefit from watching the program. Be interested, as always, in reading your evaluations. And with that, uh, I thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.